the cloud. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining early. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Such as on commercials right now. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we're going to get started in about another four or five minutes. Just give some more people some time to log in and then we will get going. Crowd already done. So weird that it's Got about 46 on, so. and I am the president of Roswell Next for this year. And I welcome you all. Thank you so much for attending. We had a great turnout last time and um, we had uh, 70, close to 75 people registered, pre-registered for this event with Jeff on the River Master Plan. So looking forward to a great informational session this time. I do want to cover a few bases before we get rolling. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Let me go ahead and share my screen real, real quick and show you 
um, because we are a membership based organization, I'm going to hit you up right at the beginning. You can join us at any time if you're not a member already on our website at the join now, even though we are virtual um, for the next, at least this first quarter, we are going to start to look into uh, um, some in person events outdoor to start it off um, and see how that goes. We had a, some great feedback from our members in a survey that we did that it would start the, more than half, about 75% of our members would, would welcome meeting outdoors. So we're gonna start to test those waters in April. So stay tuned, but with your $50 annual membership, you do get um, at least one meeting a month. And we're trying to get back into the two meetings a month. We've got our town builders breakfast, which is what you're attending right now. And then we have what's next, that's our evening event. So hopefully we can get back and get those. and then we we also have our um, roadside pickups that we do every other month. And so for any and all of that, we would welcome you to join us. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And then um, lastly, uh, and I'll come back around to this at the end, the chat, you are more than welcome to ask questions during the presentation. It'll come directly to me and we will get those questions asked at the end to Jeff. So at any time during the presentation, you have something, please don't hesitate to use that function. Um, and with that said, I am gonna turn it over to Amy Gates who will introduce Jeff. Yeah, morning everyone. Thanks. It's good to see so many familiar faces and we've missed you all the last, you know, eight months or so not being able to be a variant, but we appreciate you all. Um, we know you all have so many Zoom calls all day, so we appreciate you starting your morning with us. Um, and we're just like, as to how many people registered and how many people are here. You know, we always try to find things that are important to all of you. So obviously this is a hot topic. So I have the pleasure of introducing Jeff Leatherman. And he has been with um, Roswell for two and a half years. Somehow it seems longer. I don't know if that's good or bad, Jeff. Um, he, his position there is the Director of Recreation, Parks, Historic and Cultural Affairs. Jeff has over 20 years of experience in community recreation and local government. And he started the way a lot of us do probably, lifeguard, ski instructor, summer camp counselor. Um, he attended Cal State with a um, bachelor's in community and commercial recreation. Um, Jeff had a, several, um, Park District, uh, you know, director roles in California, and I think the most recent one was for Sacramento. I'm not sure, Jeff, if that was the most recent one or not. Um, yep. Yeah, that's so great. And so Jeff relocated over here to the East Coast, brought his um, apparently four boys, ages eight through fourteen. We met Owen this morning, who's on quarantine. <laughs> Uh, until the end of the week. So we have had a chat with Owen this morning about what, what's happening with him. Um, Jeff is married to Michelle. She's a teacher at Hunter Springs Elementary School. And like any good director of recreation um, in his free time, Jeff mountain bike hikes, camps, and anything involving lakes, rivers, and creeks. And even if that's not true, he has to put that in his bio. <laughs> We are super excited that Jeff has agreed to do this. The River Master Plan obviously has been a big one for so many of us in the community. And um, uh, I think people are just anxious to hear what's gonna be happening down there. So Jeff, I'll turn it to you. Great, thank you so much everybody. And it's, as I was kind of seeing the names pop up from, it has been almost a year since I've been with this group at my last presentation. And I was um, just a year in and still kind of getting my feet underneath me and then you know, just like so many things, as the last year has transpired and kind of come and gone, there's just a huge list of names, both uh, that I've been able to connect with and that I recognize. And, um, you know, it's just such a pleasure to, to be here with all of you um, and talk about um, the good stuff that's happening, regardless of, um, you know, some of the challenges that we've had in this past year. Um, the, the Parks Department in particular with our historic assets, our cultural affairs, um, we continue to look for ways to connect and engage with the community. Um, and the River Park Master Plan is a big anchor of that and has been uh, really since 2016. So it's a project that I inherited um, and have the pleasure of uh, continuing to move forward. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ace Sand uh, today, which is our Ace Sand property and kind of where we are. Some of you may have seen this presentation. Um, through mayor and council, which was presented um, uh, in November. And I'm gonna run through a couple of the items 
in the presentation. There's a lot of slides, um, but we won't look or spend a, a huge amount of time on all of them because I know there's also a lot of questions just on kind of the hows and what's. But you know, we're currently under contract and it's truly a testament to um, the leadership and our mayor and council that when we um, were looking at budgets back uh, in March and April of last year, so literally almost a year ago, um, the design and the progress of a sand was the only project on a capital side that wasn't frozen in our budget as we were looking at pandemics. Um, what the reaction was going to be as an as a city organization. Um, this project was uh, allowed to continue to move forward because. I think the importance to the community, but also to mayor and council um, that we didn't want to lose traction on where we were as an organization um, and truly trying to get ourselves positioned to launch the next phase of this project and kind of from a global perspective in 2016 we worked with the community to redo and kind of re envision the master plan that the parks were built by Fulton County. Um, the city has been operating those parks uh, along the river for many decades and. They're, they're at their time just to, to really relook at them from a holistic perspective and decide, okay, what do they need to be into the future? How do they integrate with the entire Chattahoochee River corridor? Uh, and since then, we've also uh, enabled or acquired the ASAN property, which we'll talk about more specifically. And so we needed to start to look at, okay, how do we start from square one and redo all of the river parks um, and rehab them in a way that is consistent with the community's vision? And um, as we start to move forward, we hired Star White House um, literally just as the pandemic was um, standing forward and, and we were able to start moving through and kind of change some things about the project. Um, and we're in the design phase right now. And so we kicked off the project in June. Um, we're into the construction documents. Uh, you'll see the building and facility that is envisioned in ASAN momentarily. Um, that just essentially goes to a conceptual level. And then we're going to get into some construction drawings on portions of the project as well. Um, so overall, if you're not familiar, when I talk about a sand, just from some orientation, if you know where the church is um, down next to Riverside, so you've got Riverside Park right there along the river, the church, and then a sand is just upriver uh, from those properties. And it was an old sand harvesting site, uh, literally pulling sand out of the river um, and using that in construction projects, concrete, other things. And uh, the city acquired the property in 2017 and has started to envision what does that need to be in the future and how do we start to integrate that into the master plan. And so Don White is kind of on the upstream side, the church on the downstream side, there's a community building, uh, children's stormwater facility, and then also a fitness trail loop is kind of the main anchors of this seven acre property. Um, and so we've been working our way through with the design team who's based out of New York, getting them familiar with uh, what, what it is about the river that we enjoy. Um, again, here's just an overview map. Uh, as I said earlier, you kind of have the river walk system and then sandbars in this kind of area. Here's a sand site right in here, 400 crossing. Um, as we start to look around the community, really what we want to make sure that we're doing within our design along the River Park Master Plan is take in um, and take on the historic assets of our community uh, in a way that is representative and thematic across all of um, our parks and facilities along our creeks and rivers. Um, and so these are the types of images and concepts that we look around in our community and the design team to start to really drive at what should these river park systems look like into the future. And as we start to kind of move our way down, um, these are some of the existing conditions you see. And for those of you that have spent time along the Chattahoochee River, you know, we've got varying degrees of erosion issues. You've got all kinds of uh, vegetation that grows right up to the river's edge. Um, a number of challenges when working in a river corridor, whether it's the Chattahoochee River or any other river, frankly, of this size and magnitude. Um, the na nature and, and the natural environments are always going to be working against you. And so as we're looking at designing a resilient park system, we have to recognize that we've got to be able to work with the natural environment in a way that promotes positive access, but also allows us to maintain the facilities. Uh, some other images just from around the property, some really cool um, old stonework, some old drainage. Um, and as we started to progress through the design, this was the original master plan. So for those of you that have been kind of part of this process, this was how we laid out the idea for ASAN in the future. Here's your building facility, 
parking, which is also a big conversation around the river, stormwater garden, and then transitions into fitness trail loop. Um, and for those of you that are um, using the facility as um, exercise, this is the connection point to Don White Park. Um, so you have the traditional multi-use trail up along Riverside Drive, but then we also wanted to be able to create some fitness loops within the River Park system as part of our over overall design concept. Um, and so if you were to come down to the river, you would be able to either increase your distance, increase your mileage, or um, for those that are potentially out for a leisurely walk, we want to be able to create environments where you can connect directly with the river. And so this is what the fitness trail loop does. Um, it also creates some uh, workout stations along this section of Don White. So if you can imagine um, potentially parking down at Azalea or parking at Riverside, you can make your way about a half a mile into this fitness trail loop section, um, find some static and uh, kinetic exercise uh, work that you can do here in this space and then potentially run or walk back. And so trying to create a way that people can exercise, utilize the facility, um, and then transition out into whether it be a recreation experience or otherwise. Um, again, just some other images as we start to look at the overall layout of the property, and you can start to see things start to take shape. Um, the event lawn down kind of in the center of the property starts to envision how do we uh, engage our community and community gathering spaces? Um, how do we allow people to connect with each other? Um, which, you know, as we're sitting here now um, on a Zoom call and you're talking about you know, transitioning yourselves into outdoor meeting spaces uh, where people can connect in groups like this. To me, these types of places become that much more relevant in this type of conversation where we want people to be able to engage with each other. Um, and I think it's, you know, as I think back a year ago, those face-to-face -face meeting spaces uh, potentially are something that we had taken for granted um, for quite some time and potentially our whole lives. And now as, as I think about it from a parks director perspective and just from a design perspective, these meeting spaces of our community um, take on a different meeting and how valuable they are, um, not only now, but also into the future. Um, and as we start to transition, for those of you that are on the engineering side, um, you're asking yourself the question of what's happening within drainage. Um, as I've transitioned out of California, especially Southern California, where it rains like twice a year, um, now we have water and drainage to deal with here in Georgia. Um, and so how do we deal with stormwater runoff? How do we incorporate that into the conversation around the Chattahoochee River? Um, and this starts to take shape in a way that we can create educational opportunities within the environment. And you'll see that take shape in, a, in the next couple of slides. Um, but these are the, the main drainage corridors. Um, we actually have the advantage if you see down in the bottom left hand corner of the slides, um, there's a natural wetland depression in this space, which also creates um, an opportunity for education, um, interpretation um, and transition into how are we managing stormwater in our facilities, but also greaterly in our community and how do we educate and interpret that uh, messaging. Um, if you've spent any time in Roswell Area Park, you'll see similar types of interpretive messaging on the bottom side of our ball, baseball fields and uh, football fields where we've made new detention um, basins in that space that deals with stormwater runoff in an educational environment. Um, for those of you that have been around, some of you may have direct recollection um, from the 70s, um, even potentially from earlier than that on kind of where we've been um, on the ASAN site. So the 38, um, we had essentially uh, fallow farmland, a lot of agricultural happening here in the community. And then that has slowly transitioned into the ASAN site as we know it today with some more vegetation starting to encroach in. Um, and the harvesting site you can see down in 2015 when that was still up and running, kind of how the property looked. Um, we've got some areas where we've got some um, deposits from the harvesting uh, activity happening along the river that we're going to have to deal with in the future. And you can kind of see it here uh, in this space. Um, again, as we start to transition, you know, community engagement meetings like this, uh, input from the community is something that is, um, it's our foundation for how we're organized. Um, these are the agencies, nonprofit, NGOs that we started to engage with early on, um, just to have an understanding of what the expectations were for them uh, in our development projects. And then as we start to transition into the broader community, um, we've had to pivot off and on on how do we engage the community in, in the midst of a pandemic. And 
I would say probably one of the biggest takeaways as a city organization and for my department in particular, um, as we've transitioned into online community engagement, what we have found is that we actually get more people engaged. Um, it's very difficult to, to pick a specific time and place where somebody can come and visit um, a facility. And uh, whether it's a night meeting when, you know, as you all look at your own schedules, as I look at my schedule with four kids, how do I carve out an hour or an hour and a half to come to a community meeting, to hear somebody like me talk about what we're doing, um, and then also give community feedback. We would average you know, maybe 30 or 40 people um, per event. Um, it's a lot of work and time. And so we've transitioned really in the last year to online and in-person community engagement. And you'll see the outcomes of that um, shortly in this slide section, but just over 300 engagements uh, in this master plan online through our website um, is significant for us. And so it's pretty exciting to be able to see one of the positive things out of a pandemic is how do we improve our operations overall to engage with the community. Um, and so the transition of the design process really starts from 2020 all the way through, or excuse me, from January or July all the way through to August. And you start to see the property take shape um, over time. So um, as we transition into a couple of different items, um, you'll see the building and the parking lot start to take shape, um, the stormwater garden there in the center, and then the fitness trail loop. And really this is driven by the natural um, environment, the drainage corridors that we have, and then if anybody's driven down along a sand property um, during a, a rainstorm, you'll know that generally this is one of the first sites that floods. And so everything in this park has to be significant resi significantly resilient um, to flood and flood impacts. And you'll see that take shape both um, in the design of the building, but also in the parking lot. The higher we can get the parking lot on the property, um, frankly, the less clearing of silt, sand and sedimentation our maintenance staff has to do into the future. Um, bottom left hand corner, you start to see that depression in the wetland take shape um, and how we potentially can get people close to it um, and then still provide that interpretive messaging overall. Um, and you'll start to see then some of the view sheds of the building and the property here shortly. Um, but this is that interpretive messaging that we starting, we're starting to see take shape that we're really driving people to connect directly with our natural environment through um, interactions with the view sheds, interactions with the wetlands that are coming through the property and also the drainage and essentially design the building to go right over the top of some of our drainage uh, corridors so that we could interpret what's happening within the natural environment. And then we'll talk about the green roof of the building um, and then using that as an interpretive message and opportunity as well. So as the building starts to take shape, we start to look at the elevations associated with it. And kind of the first questions that we had in the public input process was why the elevation of the building and the design? Well, the reality is, is we're building this building about 14 to 15 feet off of what is the current um, floor or ground level of the park in order to get it out of the floodplain. Um, and so everything that we build in this park from a, a structural perspective has to be elevated out of the floodplain. And then the challenges of getting people to that elevation through an elevator system or a ramp system you'll see shortly um, create some other design challenges that our design team has really taken on um, and used as an asset to the facility as opposed to an impact or a hindrance um, in the design process. So, you know, up here, you start to tuck in all of our HVAC equipment on the top side of the building, as opposed to on the bottom where you would normally see that. Um, you start to look at the contact points and minimizing them as much as possible. And what's that's really done is created um, some really cool view sheds around the property where essentially you can see the entire park system, even though there's a fairly large building and facility inside uh, the park. And so normally you'd walk into Roswell Area Park and you're kind of met with a very large structure that kind of impacts the view sheds. Well, the river is the focal point and the highlight of this space. And you can essentially see the river from almost any place in the park, even with the building and structure in place. Um, on the other side, you kind of have more of a passive area um, to be able to experience um, and enjoy community gathering spaces as we go. Um, I'm going to switch over. Uh, this will give you a sense of the building and facility, so bear with me just a second. 
Um, and as this is playing, we're, I'm going to jump into the chat. I'm going to let uh, this section play. And then if there's any questions associated with where we are right now, I can take those on. And you should start to see, does everybody see that coming through? Stephanie, give me a thumbs up. Okay, cool. Uh oh, all right, if I just don't touch it. Any questions in the chat so far? Yeah, we had a couple. One was, and you may address this, but um, one was about providing safe pedestrian access to the neighborhoods across the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as we transition out of this, so the um, from a city perspective, um, there's a there's a number of projects happening along Riverside Park, and transportation is actually working on um, a new connection point down at Highway Nine at Riverside Park that extends all the way into A Sand and the redesign of a sand and so we're actually working with transportation on um, safe pedestrian crossings for across from across the street into this park facility um, there's a couple of intersections um, on the entrance of the park that we're looking at lining up and the map will show me i can't remember the name of the street across from a sand but essentially our parking lot lines up directly with um, the entrance to their community uh, and then we will have either crosswalks or potentially hawk signals that will engage the community to be able to cross the street safely um, and access the facility. Great Thanks. question. Um, and then somebody was asking is the, that they've seen that there are generators and large pipes and some work already being mm. done. There. Is that to do with all of this that's going on? Great question. That is Fulton County sewer systems. Um, so they are redoing uh, the sewer transmission lines through the park facilities down to the transfer station um, at Riverside Park. Um, you'll actually start to see some other really large pieces of equipment. There's a sewer pipe that eventually will be, will start at Riverside Park um, and go underneath the Chattahoochee over to Sandy Springs. Um, and so they're essentially building or relining the pipe system from, well, it's much further than Don White Park, but through Don White Park, down a sand along Riverside into that transfer station. Um, and then we'll start to see the heavier equipment move into the park facility in the next couple of weeks. And they're gonna start that boring project um, underneath the river. Uh, and it's part of the septic system or the sewer system, excuse me, um, and the transmission lines associated with that. So nothing directly related to the park, but it will benefit us in the long run um, from a water quality perspective. We met with Fulton County Sewer uh, about two, three weeks ago, talking about how do we manage um, the septic system and the sewer system within uh, the park uh, in order to protect people that are using uh, the stormwater garden area and also the fitness trail loop. Um, and the new system will be much more resilient than what we're experiencing right now. Excellent. We do have a lot of other questions that are filtering in right now, but- um, cool. I'll you... go a couple more slides here and then um, uh, there's a really good stopping point here in just a minute. Um, so as we, as you kind of got a chance to look at uh, the building and the facility, um, overall the, uh, hold on, let me transition, I don't need to do that, sorry, now I got myself sideways here. Um, There we go. Um, the idea behind the building is really creating a community gathering space that is nimble um, with the ability to accommodate meeting rooms, meeting spaces, uh, conversations like we're having today with indoor spaces, but also kind of that broader view of how do we allow the community from a conference center perspective, a special event perspective, or even a special rental perspective access the building and facility. And so the building design um, is fairly simple. Um, is you've got a couple of different levels. You've got the ground floor level, which is the restroom right here um, in the corner that the park facility can access. So if the building is closed, there still is restrooms available at the ground level. 
When you start to get to the center level right here, that's where our meeting space becomes more apparent. And then the top of the building is intended to be a view shed and a view access point um, for the Chattahoochee River. Um, and as part of that, you can see the solar panels there at the top of the building. Um, the intent is to try to make this either a net neutral building or very close to it as possible. Um, we're looking at some geothermal um, heating and cooling elements alongside of our solar, solar system uh, in order to manage both the heat cooling and energy efficiency of the building and facility. Uh, and that really drives at the value of how are we constructing resilient communities, not only along the river, but also as a, as a government agency and hitting some of our goals and objectives in the master plan of green building strategies. And um, as you start to transition into the facility itself, this will give you a general idea of that kind of first floor operational space. So the event space, as you see, the prep room, small catering kitchen, event A, B, C, and D, you can either have those separated for multiple events happening at the same time, or you can open that building up and potentially have it accessible uh, to all of the community or to a larger group, right around 200 people or so can fit into that building space on a kind of a row chair system or potentially tables and chairs is at about 150, 180. Um, and then separating it out into a couple of different events so that we could have multiple groups or breakout sessions if you're having a small conference type concept within that building space. And really our idea as we look at the landscape in the community is how do we complement what's already happening within the community space with new hotels coming on board that this becomes a an appropriately sized conference tile space concept uh, that the community can access whether it be local businesses regional businesses from the greater metro atlanta area uh, and then also our community events and activities uh, some of the sustainability systems, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, that'll just give you a general idea of kind of the mindset coming out of the master plan of what we're trying to tackle. Um, and then as you again start to look at, you know, what are the building materials that we're looking for? Um, from our perspective, we want to be able to complement the river, want to be able to complement the natural environment. And so kind of a heavy either concrete or steel building didn't really feel like was the right type of construction. And then as soon as you start to elevate that kind of construction, it becomes very heavy. And so that's where you get the timber style building um, that is essentially a pre-manufactured timber building uh, that we can build and frame on place um, and in place. Uh, creates a fairly simple design, um, but it's lighter material that allows us to elevate the building. But then as we talked about, it's less support um, inside the facility. And so we can essentially anchor the building on our required um, ADA access um, stair systems and or elevators and the restroom. And those becomes not only our stairway systems, but also the anchor points for the building. Um, so a really cool design that complements what we're trying to, um, to showcase, which is the river, not the building, and is the natural environment, not the building. So being able to get it up and kind of out of the way, but then make it very usable has been pretty exciting in the design process. Uh, and that'll give you just a, another sense of the elevations uh, coming through, which you saw earlier. The stormwater garden, as we talk about how do we engage our community, the stormwater garden is that, that touch point for the youth in our community. Um, and looking at not only play space, but also natural environment. And as we think about, um, you know, what the value is of the Chattahoochee River, we want people to, and especially kids in our community to be able to get in and get dirty, frankly. Um, we want that hands-on experience of um, what is in and around our river system. How does it work? How does it function? What are the natural environments um, and how do they, as the youth in our community get in, maybe learn a little bit, but also get in um, and, and get dirty. And so um, to the future parents out there, um, I apologize now for how filthy and fun your kids are gonna have um, in this space. We will put a rinse off shower next to the restroom uh, so that we can clean our kids up before we put them in the car um, and potentially our dogs too. Uh, just some other images as we start to look at the design around that. Um, and th that transitions into our fitness trail loop. Uh, you've got two different types of the fitness trail loop. One is kind of more of our multi-use path that uh, will be along the river's edge and then connect into the multi-use trail up along the river. And then some smaller, more woodland style paths for some more adventures 
uh, whether it be adventures with kids or just with adults being able to get out in that feeling of the natural environment uh, through those uh, more naturalistic paths. Okay, give you a sense of where we're headed as we start to talk about the, the exercise equipment, looking at as opposed to what you would see, you know, East Roswell Park or Roswell Area Park, we have those kind of more steel structures that are a little bit more hard in primary colors. This is intended to really blend with the natural environment. So you'll see a lot of wood um, and wood type construction as part of that fitness trail loop as well. And again, just uh, some of the images that give you a sense of where we're headed within the park facility and design. Um, the outreach project, we talked a little bit about that. Um, I won't jump onto the website, but you see it there highlighted, roswellriverparks.com. Um, this is currently live. It has a lot of the information that I'm going over today. Um, and so you can use this uh, within your business, within your communities. Uh, it is available to the community to explore the ACE SAND project. And our intent is to continue to update this um, and eventually expand it to other projects so that community members can stay on top of what it is that we're doing along the river from a development Im and implementation perspective. And then also use this as uh, a way to outreach beyond our community uh, as we start to look at grant opportunities and fundraising opportunities for the implementation of the master plan. Uh, and this really, as we talked about coronavirus, this was the strategy that came out of um, what has been our kind of traditional habit of community meetings and on-site walking. How do we engage people that maybe either don't feel comfortable coming down to the river in large groups or even small groups? Um, or how do we engage people on their terms um, within their schedule? And so you'll start to see, I believe, uh, this uh, start to transition in a lot of the things that we do. We're gonna start our five-year master and strategic plan for the parks department here in the next year. And this strategy will be um, paramount to how we're going to engage the community moving forward. Uh, just some of the outcomes associated with that. And these results are also um, available on uh, that website. You can start to see when we engage the community, where are people coming from? The zip codes are there. Um, who was familiar with the master plan? And I thought this was interesting is, um, you know, and I'd say probably the biggest challenge that we have um, with long projects, transportation sees this quite a bit. When you start a project in 2016, you have people who either didn't know about it or weren't here living in the community like myself. And so 127 people um, weren't familiar with the master plan that responded to our survey. And so to me, that's just another touch point of engaging community members uh, that could create an opportunity for engagement and understanding as we move through uh, the design process. Uh, and then how are people accessing? Again, very car centric, but also on foot. Um, it was great to see that um, my paddlers started to show through that people potentially looking to access this space either um, by boat or paddle board, um, bicycling, other personal mobility devices as we start to look at making sure it's resilient and accessible for all members of the community. Um, and then what are people feeling about the River uh, Park Master Plan and what are those values? And this starts to really show, you know, how is it that we want to create that design environment to meet the community expectation, a river being the biggest one. And so as we start to talk about what is important uh, to this project, we want to make sure to connect people to the river, that they have access, that they have access to nature the trail, relax, uh, you start to see food and other things start to pop up in different areas of this conversation as well. Uh, and then uh, this one is about the use of the future site. And so passing through, um, walking, jogging, biking, 317. And, and that element is backed up by our existing trail counters. Uh, just as a side note, we're roughly re averaging at about 30,000 trips a month along the River Park Master Plan trail system at phase four and phase five, which is the boardwalk system. Um, in May of 2020, when we opened the parking lots back up post kind of pandemic shutdown, we jumped up to 50,000 trips. And so you start to see who and what is happening as a result of the pandemic, those pedestrian trips has exponentially increased along the river um, as we watch what's happening in that space. Uh, and then outdoor concerts, farmers markets, festivals, fails. Uh, I see Gila on there. Art exhibits are there as part of it. Um, and outdoor fitness trail classes, outdoor lectures, private parties. 
Um, and so as you see, kind of the community is looking for that community centric, how do we engage with each other? And then it kind of slowly fades down to the individual experience of private parties, lectures and outdoor fitness classes, um, which is part of our wheelhouse. Um, and really this is um, kind of reinforcing what we heard in the master plan process. So it's always good to have those check-ins as we go to make sure that we're still on track with our design process. Uh, children's programming, community events, again, some of those same themes as we run through. Uh, our outdoor community engagement process, uh, thank you for those of you that were able to make it out. Um, and by contrast, you have 30 to 40 attendees here in this space, but then you have 300 people that engaged online. Um, and so those are the breakdowns that tend to be fairly average when we start to talk about community in-person meetings, regardless of a pandemic. Uh, and then we're here. So we are now in the construction drawing phase of the Children's Stormwater Garden and the Fitness Trail Loop. We did receive a state grant uh, and a matching grant to start the construction of those two projects. Uh, and we'll be transitioning into the construction probably in the summer of uh, this year as we finish, finish up the uh, design and construction drawings. As you saw the building and facility, uh, just from a numbers perspective, that's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of an eight to $12 million project for the parking lot, grading and building facility. And so uh, the design of that project stops at a conceptual phase. So essentially what you see now is where that project is on hold for. And then as we look at additional funding sources, we'll transition into the construction drawings of that building uh, into the future. We essentially have the framework, meaning fire access, uh, occupancy load, ADA access, building elevations. We, the conceptual design meets all of the current codes and standards, um, but we're not into the construction drawing portion of that building design. And that's where we end. And I'm pretty close to a, on time, I think. So um, I'll stop uh, jabbering on and answer any questions that may be out there. Yeah, that was great. And I think that you answered uh, several of them as we went along. So thank you very much. Uh, um, but there are several outstanding ones. So I'll start um, throwing these your way. Uh, any plans for a restaurant? There are no plans for a restaurant in this space. And we looked at that. So if you look at the River Park Master Plan, um, the cafe concept is in a couple of different locations, uh, Azalea Park, Riverside Park, and then potentially Don White Park are the three locations um, that were looked at for more of a cafe concept, uh, grab and go, potentially uh, food service, potentially some beer and wine service. And as we look at this property in particular, the only way to, to put that cafe and or restaurant model in is to elevate it um, up into the building. And as soon as you disconnect it from uh, the park facility, it gets lost in the building structure. And from a um, value perspective, it would be really hard to actually operate any sort of restaurant or cafe disconnected from the park. Um, on the other side, if you put it down at ground level, it potentially is six or seven feet underwater at certain points during the year, um, which is extremely problematic for any sort of cafe concept with the type of equipment that would need to be in that space. Um, and so that's why we pushed it over towards the Don White Park, Riverside. Riverside Park or Azalea. Um, and there's the potential for a couple of those concepts as we look at the overall River Park Master Plan uh, moving forward. Yeah. Okay, um, that makes sense. Uh, the yellow house on the property, there's uh, a standing building. What, uh, any plans to reuse that? Is it gonna get knocked down? So I think we're talking about uh, the, his, the old house that's right there on the corner next to the church is my assumption. Um, and that building is intended to be demoed as part of this project. So the building access and driveway section um, is kind of tucked in right into that space. And that's part of uh, the demo of the property overall. Um, going back to the event space, there's a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, the, how, let's see. The revenue stream for the events. Mm -hmm. um, what is is there going to be pricing that's different for residents versus non-residents? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, yeah, philosophically. So for those of you who may know, uh, Deb Ewing um, and others are part of our recreation commission. So they are appointed by mayor and council. They're volunteers, and they really help set policy and direction for my department overall, with the exception of the historic homes. Um, and 
for probably as long as my department has been um, in existence, we've always recognized the different price point um, for residents versus non-residents for the vast majority of our activities. Some of our smaller ones, we don't, um, but I'd say probably 99.9% .9 of what we do in this building won't be any different as far as the rental space is. We recognize that you know, the taxpayers are the foundation for how we exist as a department and as a city. And so there is a different price point associated with um, residents and non-residents in our facilities now and in this one as well. Excellent. Um, kayak launch facilities. Yeah, um, probably best. To, let me jump back into uh, one of the images so I can show you that. It's a great question. Um, and yes, uh, part of what we're looking at uh, let me see if I, you actually see him right here. So he is going to launch his kayak right there. Um, there is a docking system um, that is there and actually part of the parking lot, if I can jump back, um, you can kind of see it right here is there are trailer parking spots right here in this corner. Uh, and I think we've either got two or three identified in that space as part of the first phase of the project that are connected in with the stormwater guard and the tra fitness trail loop. Um, and that transition, so here's your parking, and obviously you could do car top parking, but trailer parking here, accessing the sidewalk, coming down into this space, and then here's your dock system right here. So very similar to what you'll see uh, at Don White Park, uh, as far as launching and docking there in that space. Excellent. Um, it We've got a question about artwork. You touched on that, that that's what people would want, art exhibits, but mm -hmm. any connection with Roswell Arts Fund, putting some, some other longstanding like we see throughout Roswell uh, art projects? Yeah, so we've got really two different projects um, and Gila's on as well um, that we partner with. We have our um, Art Around, which is kind of our revolving and evolving art um, display that usually is transitioning about every 12 to 18 months. Um, I would envision that there's going to be locations where we can expand that program. And then we also have our permanent artwork spread throughout the park facilities, and that would likely expand um, to include a sand. And as we look at the master planning efforts um, on the art side, it's what are those stories that we're telling that engage the community in that natural environment from that gateway perspective. Um, and that's really the work that, that I think both us and in partnership with the Art Fund and the community can start to look ahead and start to cast that vision of how, do, how does art engage both um, on the ground and in the building and facility. And then you have kind of more of the active um, and art exhibits that have been discussed as part of kind of that overall idea, which fits well into our art and culture historic affairs side of our department um, in different ways. So as you start to think about the arts festivals and the music venues that we have already in existence, this becomes another place um, of gathering and kind of uh, just a nuance in the design process. Uh, sorry, I keep kind of jumping back in, um, but this loop right here, and you can almost see it right here in this space. If I maybe jump back one slide, you can see it a little bit better, but this is essentially a reinforced paving system around this corner that allows us to park heavy um, equipment. And so that could be food trucks, it can be exhibits, it can be all kinds of different equipment. This is a either 12 or 15 foot wide path. And the idea is to be able to use this loop as kind of that vendor space in conjunction with the building and the facility. So you have the kind of observation deck on the building here, the wraparound deck. So you have elevated experiences, our restroom buildings right here in this space and then potentially vendor space that's reinforced right here along the grass edge. This starts to become a really nice focal point from a vendor and experience perspective. Now, you're not going to get as many people in this space as you would Riverside Park, for example. Um, there's not as much square footage uh, and there's not as much parking. But as you start to think about the connection, this is really not that far off from a walking perspective. Um, to not only Don White, but also a sand and then also Riverside Park. And so from a connection, there's really the reality that you can start to create some linear events using all of our park facilities and use the river system as that transition point, whether you're paddling down the river for a, a different experience or you're walking along the path or biking, um, now you're able to connect all of these facilities together and create potentially different experiences on the same day at different locations. 
Awesome. Well, we're touching on, I've got a couple more for you and then um, we'll be done. But while you touched on connectivity, uh, some of the questions were related to the um, Riverlands project through mm -hmm. Noonan. Is there any tie in there? And then also in that same vein to Sandy Springs and how yeah. is that? Great questions. Um, so yes, as it relates to the Riverlands project, I've been sitting on um, that uh, group for probably the past almost year and a half now. Um, and looking at how does the river Roswell River Park system connect into that overall vision? And the answer is we absolutely do. Um, we're part of uh, the model um, in existence for how other communities can leverage um, river park connectivity throughout the 100 mile corridor. Um, we're, you know, as as it relates to kind of the overall project, we're far ahead of uh, the kind of our partner cities because we've got such a great vision and, and the access directly down to the river. And so we're kind of in that second phase of, you know, we built it 20 and 30 years ago, and now we're in kind of the rehab and remodel phase where others are looking at building their first time um, and making those connections. And so we absolutely do see a connection point. And kind of from a parks perspective, um, connecting over into Sandy Springs um, and up, upstream and downstream are significantly important because it starts to take the pressure off of our park facilities. Um, the more connection that people can have within their own space or their own cities and communities, um, the less trips that we're gonna start to see in our parking space and the less uh, impacts that we'll see from a transportation perspective because they can walk that river section uh, in their own backyard, they can access the river in their own space or potentially use alternative modes of transportation uh, to get here. A couple of projects that are coming. Uh, if you are familiar with the roundabout right on the county line at Willio Park, that bridge is being redone um, and that's going to construction like in the next couple of months. Um, and that creates a safe uh, bike ped crossing right there at that roundabout space where if you've ever either walked that bridge section um, or uh, try to ride it on a bike, you know that you're kind of almost taking your life in your hands in order to do it. And you almost play a little game of hopscotch of you look direction both ways, make sure there's no traffic coming and then you run as fast as you can down the bridge to get to the other side. Um, and so those connection points um, are going to be exponentially important. There's also a pedestrian bridge um, over the Chattahoochee at Highway 9 that connects us into Sandy Springs. Um, that is also a transportation project. But as you start to see that ability for people to safely walk, and I always kind of put my, my litmus test of, will I take my kids on that path in order to get from point A to point B? Um, and if I can answer the question, yes, then I think we've got a good um, plan moving forward that other families and other individuals will do the same um, and create that environment where people will directly access our facilities um, using alternative modes. And so if we can get people to park on the Sandy Spring side and walk over, advantage. Awesome. So we'll get to the two heavy hitter questions. Uh, you mentioned parking. <laughs> Where, yep. What are we doing about that? Yeah. So for those of you that know kind of the overall uh, projection um, within the river park system is we're heavily regulated by our impervious surface. So we cannot um, go beyond depending on where we are within the corridor you know, best kind of rule is about 35% of impervious surface. Um, and that includes, um, you know, any sort of paving system, essentially any time that you disturb the surface and then put hardscape, concrete or anything else in, um, it becomes and is counted against you from an impervious surface perspective. Uh, and so that limits our parking at ACE sand to about 80 uh, spaces or so. Um, and we're always playing the game of how do you manage your walkway systems, your building space, and your parking um, in order to manage the overall access and parking down at the facility. Um, and frankly, you know, and, and my speech and those of you that have heard me say this is that we can never build enough parking for the river system. Um, it will continue to, to fill up. Um, and we've seen that in the pandemic that, you know, you just don't have enough space. And so connectivity is going to be the strategy beyond providing as much parking as we legally can. Now we have to transition to how do we connect people from their neighborhoods down to the park system and do it safely. Um, that is going to be our strategy. And so as you start to think about Eves Road, um, the Gateway Project, the connectivity from Sandy Springs, the connectivity at Willio, other trail systems within our corridor that gets people from the river into other areas, whether it be community or commercial districts, 
that's going to be the strategy beyond just the parking down locally along the river. Uh, and so you'll start to see that, and you already do, if you kind of start to overlay the bike ped master plan from transportation, um, the connectivity anchor points are how do we get people to the river? How do we get people into the schools? And how do we get people in, from their neighborhoods into the commercial areas? And that'll be the strategy behind um, our next steps moving forward. Excellent. And last but not least, the million dollar question, when's it happening? When are we gonna start to see this stuff? So if there's anybody on the call that has $30 million that is willing to invest in our park facilities, that's the nugget that we're trying to crack. Um, and so while we talk about a $100,000 grant for the stormwater garden, um, those are the, are the little pieces. Um, part of what mayor and council has author also authorized is our next stage is trying to um, develop a plan, not only for grants, but also for philanthropic um, solicitation of investment into the park system. Uh, and as we have a little bit more tangible construction drawings from ASAN, that'll be the next step of how do we really look at the open market space within Metro Atlanta and beyond to fund this project. Uh, economic impact is significant. Um, if you're interested in kind of what this development means, if you go onto our um, website, we have our economic impact report, um, and I'm happy to share that uh, with the group. It's available publicly, but it sits around $10 million a year in economic impact uh, for our community once it's all developed, meaning the entire River, River Park Master Plan system. Um, so the return on the investment is significant, but more importantly, it creates an environment where people want to continue to build their businesses, uh, live within their community, bring their families um, and participate, potentially generational as we've seen um, in Roswell before. It's part of the reason why I'm here, um, not only professionally, but personally is how do I engage my family and connect along the river and in our park systems. And so um, that's the vision that's been cast in 2016. Um, there's a price point associated with it. Uh, so specifically when, don't know. Um, but as I said earlier, you know, as you look at the entire budget process, um, the commitment of mayor and council has been, this was the only project that was allowed to move forward. And so it is first and foremost on the front of our minds of how do we execute? Because the sooner the better um, from my perspective, uh, obviously I'm the parks guy, so I love building parks. Okay, give me the money, we'll, we'll do it. That's it. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Jeff. I sincerely appreciate it. And thank you for taking all those questions as well. Um, we're gonna wrap up here today. I do, we touched on transportation. Next month, our topic will be on just that. We'll have Mohammed Ralph from the city talking about transportation updates. So make sure to join us for um, on March 10th. It'll be our next Town Builders Breakfast. We'll have the link up and all that next week. So um, stay tuned on that one. Um, I'm sorry if I missed any of your questions. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to us at general at roswellnext.org if you have anything following up and we will be happy to try to answer what we can or direct you to the person that can answer it if we can't. And lastly, all of you are going to get a coffee gift card today to Scooters for attending. So we really appreciate you being here. And um, so check your email for that. And just thank you to everyone. We ended up having over 60 participants on this morning and uh, we love to see that in the turnout happening and um, your participation. So um, lastly, well, let's plug the parks department. Uh, make sure to go to roswellgov.com backslash you know what I'm trying to say, the backslash line <laughs> and um, so park planning. And we will um, have this recording along with that URL uh, as a follow-up in an email and on our social media. So make sure to check that out. And uh, thank you again, really appreciate it. Bye everyone. Thanks everybody.